Mark Shapiro. Uh, I'm not going to take long to answer this for the lunch hour. I want to have everybody in the meetings to answer questions as well as to give you a spiel. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, we set up a fellowship for a journalist. Um, the first one and then two journalists come here in the summer and get to take a summer course at their, their choice in return for having to come and pontificate uh, on some subject during the summer. And the first journalist was Mark Shapiro. And Mark, if Mark is, well, he was many, many years ago when he was young. He was the, he was at the Center for Investigative Reporting and then traveled the world and went back. The center is in San Francisco and it is a, uh, a group, of, it's small, like everything good, it's small. It's, uh, it's a group of about a half dozen journalists who are on site and then another dozen on contract who do all kinds of media work, produce shows, do all kinds of things. And uh, Mark is the editorial, editorial? editorial. Uh, director of the, the center. Uh, he's also the author of a very interesting multi-dimensional book, which actually there's a lot more to it than I think even the, the title's catchy, Exposed the Toxic Chemistry of Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. And actually, though, a lot is crammed in there, and what's at stake for American power um, is, I think, some of the most interesting part of it, because it's a comparative look at Europe and the United States. And we will have a bunch of copies of those books for those who want to purchase them. Whether or not this man will graciously sign any of them and thus greatly increase their value, <laughs> we'll do that. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Shapiro. Thank you. Thank you. Cyprus in the south to uh, Poles 
falling as the election returns streamed in, 20 different languages and television screens across the room. It was a tremendously exciting day. And on that day, basically 782 uh, members of the European Parliament were elected to their posts in, in, in Brussels. And I would say there was almost not a single American journalist present. Um, there were no television.
could be contributing to this, these conditions. And so they began uh, imposing a series of controls over the chemicals in, uh, in the goods of the, of, the, of the global economy, which is what it was called exposed, the toxic chemistry that everything across. And then I'm going to get into a little bit of what's at stake for American power, because ultimately that's what this story is about. So about a year, about a year, uh, about a year after this seminal election, which, by the way, the majority of Christian Democrats uh, to the uh, European Parliament, uh, uh, I returned to Brussels. I discovered a number of things happened. <coughs> the European uh, Union, excuse me, got to the blood sugar. Mm. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the European Union had passed a law basically banning uh, substances that were determined to actually cause cancer or cause uh, mutations in uh, genes or cause damage to the reproductive system from what? From cosmetics. Who knew that these substances were even in cosmetics? We here in the United States certainly had no idea. Nobody, who, who, was, who ever suspected that there were such substances in, in cosmetics? We here, nobody told us here in the United States that, uh, that cosmetics could contain carcinogens or reproductive toxins. Well, the Europeans began looking at the uh, ingredients in, uh, in cosmetics and uh, created a list. <clears throat> the reason we even know this now is because the Europeans created a list. They called it the negative list. And anything that was a carcinogen, a mutagen, or a reproductive toxin uh, was put on that list. So they called them CMR. They call them. So these substances, a list was developed, about 400 substances were put on these lists. Suddenly, cosmetic manufacturers who wanted to sell their products in the European Union suddenly had to start reviewing negative lists that they never even had to think about. Them. So, uh, <coughs> my, uh, my, uh, one of the questions I asked in this book, and I asked in a number of different industries, was what's the response of American companies to these laws? Because we all know about the globalized economy, we all know that we <coughs> globalized integrated economically, capital flows across the countries. And what has happened is, of course, the European Union has become one of the major markets for American goods. Another thing that's happened that most uh, Americans uh, have not really been aware of, which is that the European Union uh, is now the world's largest single market. So this is a role that has long been played by the United States. We uh, have got an enormous strength in this country from the internal market that one single market in the United States, which is both immensely powerful and has powered our own industry, of course, because we have an enormous country, and, uh, and two, it's enabled us to leverage our influence around the world because we create standards. People want into the biggest market in the world. We are we have been in that market, and so the rest of the world is going to follow the United States. Now that has changed, and this comes from uh, uh, no less authoritative source than our own central intelligence. Which reports that in 2005, uh, the European Union surpassed the United States as the world's biggest market. So suddenly, suddenly, um, in, um, in 2005, these laws start coming down from Brussels. Who the hell's been thinking about Brussels other than a beautiful place to go visit? They have good beer and mussels and, uh, and freaks, and some interesting artists, certainly, and maybe a venture with saxophone. But suddenly, from uh, this city in, in Belgium are coming these, uh, these new laws that let's just stick with cosmetics for now. So basically, CMRs have to be removed from cosmetics. The question is, what does an American company do? An American company are accustomed to operating toward American rules, and those American rules in the case of cosmetics have basically given uh, 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 the FDA has essentially no power to Cosmetics has essentially been unregulated in this country for decades. And if you ever thought, those of you who use cosmetics, that somebody somewhere had actually said that the ingredients in the mascara or the creams or whatever it is uh, was safe, uh, I'm here to tell you that there's nobody doing that. Uh, uh, that is an illusion that, uh, that, that, that most of you probably don't be punctured, but <laughs> I'll do it in any case. 
So basically, there's nobody here in the United States that with the independent authority to say, we can say, so the European Union has this negative list. What do American companies do? Well, I went to an American company there. I went to the uh, headquarters of Procter & Gamble. So Procter & Gamble is the biggest company in the world. I'll just go through this one example just to give you a little taste of the shifting power that we're talking about. I think the impact on our world is back here in the United States. I went to Procter & Gamble in Brussels. It's the largest, world's largest uh, consumer product.
said, well, you know, it's, uh, we don't really need laws like that in the United States. What we have here in the United States is a tort system. <laughs> Which I don't have to explain to you. In fact, you can probably explain to me. But uh, here we have a here in the United States we have a tort system, and so uh, the tort system is enough to basically make sure that if we're going to violate any uh, basic principles, we will be held accountable in a court of law. It's all your job. And uh, and, uh, and and if we if we if we if we do anything dangerous to our customers, we're going to find ourselves with a hundred lawsuits and look at look at Merck and Vidox and look at Ford and Pinto. Yeah, he knew all these things. He knew all the cases that had been lost by major companies on, on product liability. So we have a product liability system. So here you get at the heart of these two competing regulatory models. You have one, a model here in the United States, which we've now become accustomed to, which I'm sure you learned about in your courses here, which has an extremely high level of proof in terms of determining damage from uh, health damage from, uh, from, 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 from chemicals. Thank you. 
key principle, what's one of the key evidentiary principles for uh, proving liability? Harm, and the opposite of harm, is that something what could have been produced more safely otherwise, right? It's, it's probably a more legal term than that. But that, in other words, there are safer ways to produce something, and you, as a company, chose a way that was more dangerous to citizens and therefore to be liable. I, I think I may not have formulated that perfectly, but I think there's a legal concept. Right? He says, if you could produce it more safely in other ways than you chose not to, then that can be part of the evidence. Well, what's going to start happening? I'll just throw out here some dangling, uh, uh, tantalizing uh, uh, idea when, uh, when, a, when the other major economic uh, body is forcing companies that are essentially the parallels of our companies to begin producing goods basically safer and less toxic to citizens in a foreign jurisdiction, which is essentially what's happening now in the European Union. So what does that mean for product liability here in the United States? I would just kind of throw that out as an interesting legal question, particularly if they're a foreign subsidiary of an American company. And there are some people who are tempted to steer already, mostly not in the but in the coverage company. But I think we will. Um, so, so uh, across the board, the, uh, the, the, these policies that I've described are uh, happening not only in cosmetics, but also in toys, banning phthalates in toys, which are seen as being an endocrine-disrupting uh, chemical. The, uh, decreases the uh, phthalates, you probably know, the plastic. These little plastic things that make toys soft.
he kind of <coughs> answered where is he? Well, he said, yeah, I guess uh, there's there's kind of one thing that, that yeah that, is, that you might want to be aware of. And I said, uh, oh yeah, what was that? He said, well, <coughs> the, the, well the company has decided to uh, reformulate all our products globally according to the cosmetics directive of the European Union. So uh, that and that announcement was not made. Yet. Well, you know, we've got a little announcement on our British website. So you go into the British website and you tuck deep into the folds of the British website, and there it is, a little announcement about how Procter & Gamble, the world's biggest trans uh, uh, consumer products company, has decided to reformulate all of its products according to these provisions of the European Cosmetic Directive, meaning taking all the CMRs out of their products. So what does that mean? Number one, Number one, what it meant for me personally was that I had to go and rejigger my old chapter around. <laughs> uh, but after I did that, um, uh, after I did that, I, uh, what does it actually mean? It means one, Americans, us in this room and in this country, are basically accidental beneficiaries of a law in a foreign jurisdiction. Right? We we are kind of, we get the benefit from this law in a foreign jurisdiction. Two, what does it really mean? Is it means that the Federal Food and Drug Administration that is supposed to regulate these questions has, has uh, maneuvered and has, has, is now in a position of complete irrelevance to the decisions of a major American company. That's what it really means in terms of long-term uh, presence in the United States. So that, that's, that's why this part of the book, What the State for American Power, is, is I think, at the heart of Changes that we're talking about here. So you have the FDA that's, that's basically not even considered any longer by a huge drug company that the court since it had. So um, I basically just kind of want to leave you with some of these thoughts. There's some more substantial. There's, I will add one, uh, one extra uh, picture because I talk in the book about how this similar dynamic is playing itself off across major American industries, including cosmetics, including the electronics industry. Billions of dollar uh, electronics industry, um, in which even China is beginning to move ahead of the United States when it comes to protecting its citizens from chemical contaminants. Um, and also, in looking at the long term sort of health costs that the, that the Europeans have been doing, they've been coming up with a sy systematic approach. These are all specific chemicals, specific industries I've been talking about. There's another uh, initiative which I think is going to have enormous impact. Globally, on America's position, America's economic position, and that is something called REACH, which, is, which stands for uh, Registration, Evaluation, Authorization of Chemicals, and um, a very condensed version. Those of you who I'm sure are familiar by now with the nuance of Tosca, as I'm sure your professors here <laughs> share with you the, 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 the perfection of which um, Tosca has brought you. Of course, one of the key things in Tosca was that it grandfathered onto the market and had some uh, 65,000 chemicals. But today, on the American market, uh, some 80% of the chemicals now on the market have never been screened for toxicity at all uh, by the EPA, because they were exempted from the So, um, uh, in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, the rest of the world followed the American lead. So when we passed Tosca in the 19, uh, late 70s, uh, early, sorry, early 70s, thank you. <laughs> we passed Tosca in the early 70s, and the United States was the first country to take such an action to protect the effort and attempt to regulate chemicals. But the rest of the world followed. The rest of the world followed. Number one, they followed because it went well. We got all these virus running around. Maybe we should start doing something about the uh, environment. They followed us. Two, critically, they wanted access to the American market. They got access to the American market. They had to abide by American rules. <coughs> and so, uh, in those days, the world followed America, but there was this critical hole in Tosco, which had to now grandfather into the market some uh, 65,000 chemicals. And the rest of the world grandfathered them also, including the European Union, which was then the common market. So they did the same grandfathering trick that we did. 
But the years have gone by, three decades have gone by, more and more evidence about chemical uh, contaminations of surface, obviously, and physiological studies. And the Europeans have begun assessing, like I talked about earlier, the public health impacts of this situation of having 65,000 chemicals on the market that are not, not tested, of which there is very little knowledge because they were all going to the market. So they passed a law called REACH, which essentially is going to require all the existing chemicals, all the, all, the, all the chemicals on the market that have been grandfathered in, which is basically 80% of chemicals, so basically all chemicals, will now have to go through a toxic screen uh, before they're allowed to be included in products sold in the European Union and industrial chemical compositions. A whole very, very systematic process that's going to take 11 years. It's going to take 11 years. And it's enormous. It's basically a chemical inventory in a way of the global but it's not as lumbering and, 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 and massively, uh, um, that sounds even more massive than, it's, it's, it's very systematic, it, 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 uh, it's true that, but that is going to uh, hugely change the dynamic of how chemical uh, uh, contamination is considered in the global economy. What happens? All the spokes of the global economy, uh, including the American Their production to the toxic stream in, in the European Union and Helsinki. They have a whole office called the European Chemical Bureau. And so, this is when, when American products are put side by side, American products that have never gone through a toxic screen are put side by side next to European products that have, uh, you can start surmising which direction the market may move pretty quickly with the rise in consciousness of environmental consideration. So, that's another aspect of why I talk about the state for American power. It's also uh, finally, I looked at very carefully in each of these uh, instances at the economic impact that these moves had across the board uh, in the European Union and the effect that they had on the industry. Because I want to know, from just like you, just like anybody else, when industry says, wait a minute, this is going to throw people out of work, this is going to create an economic crisis, this is going to dampen innovation, this is going to cause a uh, massive economic dislocation, which is an argument we're very familiar with here, and the same argument has been used in Europe. Uh, uh, what happens? The amazing thing to me is like nobody's actually checked to see what happens. I mean, I, I look for stuff to find out what happened, and, and it's not happened. Nobody's done these follow-up studies. Well, I went and did my own reporting, and I found out, I talked to analysts, I talked to investment advisors, I studied the annual reports, I went to the trade associations, and I found out this cataclysm that had been predicted had never happened. There had never been a dislocation. The people were never thrown out of work. What happened was industry adapted to a new level playing, to a new playing field. The, 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 the government raised the, the bar, and the industry adapted and found innovation, and found new, new ways of doing things in a less uh, destructive manner. So uh, I think that may be something there to be a few of this country to consider what they see these debates. I actually wanted to call the book Calling the American Block, but um, my publisher thought it sounded too much like a card game or something. But uh, I think there is a lot of this kind of kabuki theater in America where we have this battle that's kind of repeated over and over again uh, on questions of uh, environmentalists argue. Uh, we were talking earlier, actually, with, uh, with, uh, with professors here on the, uh, on the question of uh, what happened with the clean era and the scrubbers, you know, and, and the mayor, and the debate in the uh, industry was, was, was going to drive that business, you're crazy, it's going to cost too much money, of course, successfully found a way to innovate and, uh, and create cleaner air as a result of the era. But the point that I want to make here is that the actions that are happening in Europe right now are prompting innovation, they are not constricting industry, and I'm sure that the European Union has no interest in sending its industry out of business. So with that uh, portrait, I'm hopefully I kind of evoke this changing dynamic where essentially environmental questions of environmental values and environmental health meet the road with, uh, with political power and with economic influence. And I think that's the big uh, change that's occurring right now. Uh, as we speak, it's a really awesome time to, to be around, as I suppose it is any historic period. <laughs>
<laughs> when you're in it. But uh, this, I think, is one of the one of the big tectonic shifts that's happening in the world right now. So there's that kind of world. Um, um, open it up to questions. Of course, there's more in the book. If you <laughs> questions? Questions. I have questions. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you for coming. I had the pleasure of reading your um, article on Harper's. On oh, the yeah. Same issue. Oh, right. And um, I'm also a professor here, here, so I'm sorry I missed the opportunity to talk with you earlier. But um, actually, I think you have a very good example here of why our tort system works. Uh -huh. uh, instead of us having to do that kabuki battle in the industry and say, hey, we got to just like Europe, we're going to have the same rights, same everything, just so we can be the same, we get the same benefit without passing the rules because they're afraid of the evidence that will come in from their disclosures to Europe. So they end up producing the product, as happened with, with your, your example here, following the same obligations that they yes. would for Europe yeah. here in the US. Yes. And the reason they're doing it, I would advocate, is that the tort system scares them enough that they're like, forget it. Yeah. We, it's easier to conform to one rule yeah than it is to have these two different systems, albeit the American system right now, at least on its face, is a, is a dirtier system, perhaps. Um, but in the end, it's not. And it's not partly because torts evolve with other standards, whether they're international or local, and regulations do not. And that, in a way, we are moving faster and keeping right up with the European Union because of our tort system. And, uh, and and that you have a very good example of that in, in your little story. And I would also argue that maybe with REACH, we will move to that same place for the same reason, um, albeit it'll take 10 years because that's how long it's gonna take for REACH to mean anything in Europe. Yes. Um, and, and I would also argue that probably if you had seen the early on discussions in Europe about the ban and so forth, you would have heard, you know, the same arguments from the companies at the end oh, yeah. of the life as we know it, yes, and yes. our product will never, and I agree with you totally that they say that every time, and yeah. every time it's pretty much meaningless, so, thank you. Yeah, thank you, that's a really good point, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a very good point, because you're right, I think that, I think the, the tort system is, act, does act like a check, and they're afraid of the information that's coming out of Europe, because right. they don't I would just add one little twist to that. Is that, is that basically, is that you're right that in terms of the big picture, and big companies are starting to, big multinational companies are starting to adapt to European standards. They want to hold on to the market. And what that, but there's a, a trick to that, which is that because these are driven by the market, these are market driven forces. Number one, obviously, it's very democratic from, from America. Usually. But two, it's, uh, it's because you don't have a law. Companies that are not major multinationals, that are companies that produce in, uh, you know, in China or some offshore place somewhere, and they don't care about the European market. All they care is about selling uh, something. They can then produce things that don't meet those standards and dump and drop them in the United States. That's true. Crazy, that's what's happening. So that, that's that's the difference there's that a law makes. So yeah, there's, there's a risk. But but again, if you tell me that the European market is the largest market, and it would have to be that to make it the European way is greatly more expensive for that to be true. Say that again. To make it in compliance with the European rules right. would have to be much more expensive yeah. for them to want to proceed under, okay, we won't sell in Europe so we can dump in, in right. the U.S. and other places. Right. These are the no-name people. Though. These are yeah, the no-name dollar store. Mm -hmm. Some people are 20 the Walmart stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's just poor people. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Hi. A, a quick comment on that. Corporations are always going to be rational, do a cost benefit analysis, and yeah. if they think they're going to make more money by continuing to put potentially toxic ingredients into products, and that's going to be uh, more profitable than, than taking them out and risking tort reform than continue doing it. But the question I wanted to ask you about, you seem very optimistic about the Europeans 
ability to follow this course, and yet there's an enormous explosion of lobbying in Brussels, yeah. corporate yeah. lobbying, that is starting, you know, it seems to take Brussels down the same path that yeah. Washington <coughs> is going on with corporate influence and corporate money um, uh, influencing the course of legislation yeah. and how regulations are made and who's benefiting how tight they are. I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, that you're, and you're absolutely right, and I always don't fear uh, giving an over-idealized uh, <laughs> vision of the European Union because the, you're absolutely right. Number one, the, the lobbying at the level both of European industry and Americans is massive. On the, you know, a huge explosion, I think a tripling of the number of lobbyists in the past five years in, uh, in Brussels. So, uh, both the European lobbyists, also American lobbyists, who just flooded from Washington to, to Brussels. individually. 
we don't represent a constituency. Do you think like uh, businesses like uh, particularly like Body Shop and being more socially responsible influence the the path the, the European Union has moved towards that? You know, like particularly like uh, I think her name is Rodnick was very involved with that. And, and what do you think is is that did that bring about that change as well? Um, <coughs> I think the Body Shop just I think I think what the body I think. Yes, I think there's kind of a rising, uh, uh, if you want to know what helped, I think, propel those issues forward in, in Europe, I think, like the discoveries of 1999, all these newspaper stories, kids uh, sleeping in cancer or creating sleep or that, 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 that contain carcinogens. And, uh, and, and this alarmed a lot of people and helped create a copy of the party question. Anita Roddick, I don't know if she came up with you know, a brilliant idea. She, she obviously saw changes in the zeitgeist in terms of people's uh, attention. I don't think it changed this thing. I think I think it's part of a larger consciousness of a changing market zeitgeist that I think um, um, that she saw that people would care about these issues. And, and so clearly it's more natural over there. I think it's more of a reflection.
So basically, what they say is that the Europeans treat every lion as if it's a wild lion, and the Americans treat uh, the lions. And, and he's essentially saying, we know how to put bars up around the lion. And so you trust us, and we know how to control the lion. It's basically what both of them are saying in their own way. And so it's up to you to decide. I mean, the, basically, your decision or our decision or public decision to decide whether that's enough. To get to your point, it's very isolated. In other words, they talk about the one lion. They didn't talk about how the lion might interact with the, with the turkey and the tigers and the other chemicals that the lion is a chemical in the zoo, which is what the Europeans do. They're very fundamental difference between the Europeans <coughs> and the risk. Um, maybe a loaded question, but uh, the um, there's some indication that there might be a, a kind of a petition to the World Trade Organization or the World Trade Agreement in, in that because American companies or foreign companies for that matter want to trade, they want to trade in Europe, uh, have to produce their own data to the European Chemical Commission, um, that that itself is kind of creating a uh, you know, trade barrier. Factor in comparative risk. So that when Procter and Gamble reformulates its product, which 
do they have another mechanism for screening the new product to identify potential CMRs? And if so, where, where on earth are they getting this science? Well, do that. Yes. The uh, system, the system is, is kind of, it's systematized. So if you propose an alternative, what, what you have is, is a, uh, a committee of scientists that are associated with the uh, health director in the European Commission. And that meeting may meet uh, quarterly in Brussels, a group of toxicologists from all over Europe, and they assess the literature essentially on all the different They determine to be CMRs are put on a negative list and those that are determined not to be and do an assessment of the literature uh, are allowed to be used in, in uh, cosmetics. So it's just so CMRs, it wouldn't be just CMRs, heart disease. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There may be, uh, yeah, some people in a lot of environmental groups think that cosmetics are not to be strong enough. And, uh, mm -hmm. and there are even natural cosmetic companies in America that are saying we're going to wait for But the comparison with the, the, in fact, and you can get all their data it's on the web. It's not like a big secret. In fact, it's in footnote. It's uh, very extensive footnote. Uh, and there are web addresses for the. I think it's called the Scientific Committee. Yeah, it's called the Scientific Committees on Consumer Products. So that would be the like, like a literature review. Yeah, they're not yeah. doing clinical studies. They're not doing epi studies. They're no, just, they're I mean no, but they're collecting data from all those. Uh, Epidemiological yeah. studies and toxicological studies from both. Meta studies. Yeah. The main set of literature. And the, 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 the comparison here in America is you have a team of toxicologists who do meet to provide recommendations to the American uh, cosmetics industry, but they're sponsored by the industry. Mm -hmm. and kind of the, the industry trade association called this meeting. You know, I think we're getting close yeah. to our two o'clock time. I'm going to give you one more question. And that is, do you want to comment a little bit on China's reaction to this in terms of their home market? Yes, yes, that is, yes. We <laughs> uh, travel the world in this book. And, um, uh, and, and uh, I talk about China because it's, it's a, I mean, it's a very good question. Uh, ultimately, if you're doing anything in the global economy, if you're aiming an environment, you have to, you basically have to end up in China. So I look at China, I look at China in some detail to find out. Uh, 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 essentially, we all know there's an the environment crisis in China. If you're doing all the work here, the deal with We all know that. So uh, the question is, where are the Chinese getting their ideas to move forward and to, deal, and to try to deal with this environmental catastrophe? That certain leadership. And, uh, and to a great extent, because the Europeans are very aggressive when it comes to uh, energy, so they're all over the place with wind and technology and everything, uh, they are beginning to leave a very powerful imprint on China's approach to its environmental crisis. Here's how REACH works, and, and the laws work. When this law was passed, the, the REACH law, the Europeans sent Consultants all over the world to tell the, the spokes of the global economy, this is all you know, a huge global economic system, how to adapt to their laws. So now what you have is in China, you have a rigorous system now being developed, it's not rigorous yet, it's it evolved. Uh, so basically, begin to systematically assess the nature of the chemicals that are produced in China and integrated into products and sold to the European Union. And I asked this guy, I said, I, I, the European Union appointed three environmental counselors to explain these policies to the world. Because they missed a striking at the heart of the global economy. They sent one to the United States of America. They sent one to China. We got there like about a year and a half ago. He's the EU's environmental counselor in China. And they just sent the third environmental counselor to uh, India. So these ideas are going deep, deep into the global economic system. So when it comes to China, number one, they're beginning to consult. How do we do a systematic analysis of the chemicals that, are, that we're producing here, this mass engine of an economy that we're producing? And even I talked to some Chinese officials who work at the university and the Ministry of Environment there, and they said, you know, one interesting effect 
is it's actually beginning to make more transparent the process, production processes in China that have been typically obscured and shrouded in mystery and, uh, and secrecy because we actually have to begin to understand ourselves what is in all this stuff that we're producing. So it's having its other the second part of what's going on in China, or another aspect of it, is that the um, Chinese, which have traditionally been the recipients of all the toxic, all the electrical waste that comes from our country, Europe, and all around the world, all the cell phones, and DVDs, and iPods, and computers, and printer monitors, and all that crap that after five years we throw in the garage or we bring down to the dump or the recycling center, whatever been ending up in China, as well as Nigeria and a few other places. Well, the Chinese have basically um, are tiring of, of being in this position, number one. Two, they have a broken consumer economy. They don't sell it to buy a lot of people in the product. So what happened? The Chinese passed a law which uh, basically bans the same six heavy metals and toxic chemicals that the European Union has banned when it comes to electronics. All electronic, all of which I'm sure we have in our pocket. I've got my cell phone, got your iPod player, whatever it is. All those things have had to go through a toxic spring in the European Union. The whole electronics industry is going through a huge change. And the Chinese have now passed a law based on that of the European Union, banning those very six, same six chemicals from, uh, from use in electronics that are sold inside China. And the trick to that is what have they exempted? Exports. So they've exempted exports from their law on banning uh, chemicals or toxic chemicals from use in electronics. And they've exempted exports. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> exempted exports. And those uh, exports, where did they come from? They come right here. We don't have laws prohibiting this kind of activity. So uh, that's the picture.
Yeah. 